Hey guys, today's real special, but in case you hadn't heard, it's Dr. Seuss's 120th birthday, so please spread the word. If you're worried I'll run out, I've got rhymes by the plenty, and I'll be rhyming a lot since Dr. Seuss is 120, while he may sadly not be with us anymore. That doesn't mean we can't celebrate his legacy we adore. And on my channel, what better way than to review the adaptations to celebrate his birthday? I won't be counting the movies, no I will not. But I will be counting the TV specials, and there were a lot. But I won't be counting the ones that aren't directly based on any of his books. I know I'm rhyming a lot, but don't give me any looks. Just like in my 12 Days of Christmas event, I'll be counting down the top 12 that are present. But this time, it'll all be in one video. And if you like this way better, please let me know. Okay, so to those who are still here and haven't departed, let's end this rhyming intro and let us get started. Number 12, The 500 Hats of Bartholomew Cubbins, one of the earliest adaptations of Dr. Seuss's work, and probably the rarest too, mostly because it went down with all the other Puppet Tunes episodes. In case you didn't know, Puppet Tunes was a series of stop-motion animated shorts. Unlike the book, where Bartholomew has 500 of the same hat, he has 500 different hats, with the 500th one being a crown, and by having that crown, he ends up becoming king, and just before he was about to get beheaded for having so many hats. Number 11, and to think I saw it on Mulberry Street. Another one of the early Seuss adaptations done in stop motion animation, but not as rare as Bartholomew Cubbins, mostly because it was seen in the movie In Search of Dr. Seuss. Basically, it's a visualization of the main character, Marco's made up story he plans to tell his father when he gets home. Since this was based on the very first book Dr. Seuss published, can't really complain for it being so simple. Number 10, The Zacks, the second of the three adaptations featured in Dr. Seuss on the Loose, and probably the shortest one as well. Yes, even shorter than the stop-motion ones. It focuses on a Zacks going south and a Zacks going north, and when they bump into each other, they both refuse to move out of the way, or going east or west, as they prefer to put it. This results in them standing the test of time, literally, because they never die, and they just stand there like statues for the rest of their lives as time goes on. What kind of message was Seuss trying to give from this story? I guess is that the story was trying to teach kids not to waste time with things that aren't worth their time. Which is pretty much what both Zaxes did. Waste their time. Did those Zaxes have any life other than going north or south? Didn't they have any family who was looking for them? Who knows. But it still has more story than the previous two. Number 9, The Sneetches. The first of the three adaptations featured in the aforementioned Dr. Seuss on the Loose. Wanna know how I feel about this story personally? It's freaking terrible! The Starbelly Sneetches say that they're the best Sneetches on the beaches, but they're actually the worst. Doing whatever they can to make themselves better than the plain-bellied Sneetches. Being relentlessly cruel to them. Honestly, I wish the Star Removal Machine was a Sneetch cooking machine. Because the plain belly snitches shouldn't have to live with such birds. Yes, I know they changed their ways at the end of the story, with the lesson of treating others equally. But still, there was no excuse. Honestly, I would have rather had an adaptation of Yertle the Turtle, because at least the main antagonists of the story actually got what they deserved at the end of the story. Meanwhile, the star belly snitches got away scot free. Number 8. Horton Hatches the Egg. The animated debut of Seuss's favorite elephant and the first adaptation done by Warner Brothers, whether it be through them directly or by Chuck Jones. It was created during the Bob Clampett era of Looney Tunes, and it was released as part of the Merry Melody series. Most of the changes from the original story were merely comical, such as the hunters aiming at Horton's butt rather than his heart, Maisie doing cartoony things such as making herself more attractive to get Horton's attention, or breaking the fourth wall. They even added a fish that looks like Peter Lorre, Honestly, Horton should have just did this to them when they aimed at his butt. <coughs> Considering Seuss's stories had no continuity, except for in the Cat in the Hat books, we can only guess what happened to the elephant bird at the end of the story. Number 7, Daisy Head Maisie. The very last adaptation of Seuss's work, and the only one done with digital ink and paint. It was produced by Hanna-Barbera Studios, Again, fitting because Warner Brothers started the hand-drawn animated Dr. Seuss adaptations. Chuck Jones working on three of them. 
and the movie rights to the Dr. Seuss books are now owned by Warner Brothers. The story is about a young girl named Maisie, who somehow grows a daisy on her head and ends up becoming famous. Considering the story was published after Dr. Seuss's passing, it's surprising that they didn't make any other adaptations of Seuss's posthumous work. Number 6, Green Eggs and Ham, the third adaptation of Dr. Seuss on the Loose. It's pretty much a word-for-word -word adaptation of the original story, but slightly altered in some way to help fit within the time frame of Dr. Seuss on the Loose, and to help squeeze in the songs that were shoehorned into the special. But of all three of the adaptations that were featured in Dr. Seuss on the Loose, Green Eggs and Ham was the best, the Zacks was too short, and the Sneetches, well, the Sneetches can suck green eggs. Number 5, The Cat in the Hat the third primetime adaptation of Seuss's work. So, this is the last Dr. Seuss special that Chuck Jones worked on with Seuss himself. But in comparison to the other two he previously worked on, this one looks a bit more Seussy, rather than being a direct adaptation of the original story. They decided to make a few changes that removed the ball balancing trick, has bigger words than the original story, and a different way the house becomes messy. Still, more enjoyable than the live action film. Though I should point out that the kids seem to side with the cat more than they do in the book. Though, to be fair, the cat's antics are far less messy than they were in the book. Number 4, The Butter Battle Book. The one Dr. Seuss adaptation that was the most faithful to the book as possible. The special was so good, I would have ranked it higher, but... But I ranked it at number 4 because... Uh, but I ranked it at number 4 because of the cliffhanger and Hank... <laughs> I ranked that at number 4 because of the cliffhanger ending that may have scared a lot of kids when they watched it. This ending wretched my gears for years, or I'm not intended, because there was no clear answer to what would happen. Though Seuss's intention was to replicate real life, basically how not everything can be resolved easily. I'll admit, real life sucks sometimes. It wasn't until the TV series adaptation of Green Eggs and Ham where they changed the story enough to make it their own, but still. It gave me some closure on how the story should have ended, peacefully. Number 3, The Lorax. This adaptation was the second darkest Dr. Seuss adaptation, next to the Butter Battle book, of course. The adaptation expands upon the original story by adding a layer of depth to the Onceler, by having him question his actions. When he brings up that shutting down his factory wouldn't be good for the economy, even The Lorax admits that he doesn't have all the answers. The once lawyer even seemed like he was about to do something to rectify his actions. But then he got a call that basically pushed him to bigger his factory. Heck, they even gave an explanation to why they didn't grow more trees to begin with. Basically, it's because of how long it takes for a truffula tree to grow. About 21 years, almost. Honestly, though, if they would have grown another forest of truffula trees, like most companies would, for pencils, paper building wood, etc. They could have marketed the need as a limited quantity thing, one that would have been worth more than $3.98. Also in the animated movie, the reason they chopped down all the trees was because they were too tall to harvest any of the truffula leaves. But here, it looks like the Wunzler could have made the needs without chopping down all the trees. The one thing I should bring up is that the Lorax is the only other story to have a cliffhanger ending, just like the Burbell book did. However, unlike the Burbell book, this ending actually leaves you to decide what you would do if you were given the last truffula seed. Kind of like what the Cat in the Hat story did when it asked, well, what would you do if your mother asked you? If it were me given the last truffula seed, I would plant it in a pot, let it grow inside that pot, then take it outside once it's grown enough to finish growing. Whoever made the movie probably also had that ideology. Number two, Horton Hears a Who. The second Seuss adaptation worked on by Chuck Jones. The Whoville shown here is much different from the one shown in How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which was even more evident in the movies, where here the Whoville is placed on a speck. The Whoville in How the Grinch Stole Christmas is placed on a snowflake. The special also has a style that's more faithful to Seuss's other work than Horton Hatches the Egg did. Fun fact, this story was actually the third story in the trilogy of Horton stories. The second one, Horton and the Quugger Bug, was released as part of Red Book in 1951, three years before this story came out, in fact. But the strange thing is, the elephant bird from Horton Hatches the Egg doesn't make an appearance in either of these stories. The kangaroo, originally unnamed, is named Jane here, and the name has stuck for subsequent versions of the character. 
Number one, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. After a few attempts at adapting Dr. Seuss's work, this one set the standard of how his work should be adapted for TV specials. One of the notable differences between the book and the special is how the Grinch looks. In the book, it's said that he resembles Dr. Seuss, but in the special, it's said that he resembles Chuck Jones. Of course, a lot of major characters in the book don't look exactly the same in the special, especially Cindy Lou Who. One of the major events that happens in the special that never happened in the book, one that impacted a lot of us, was how the Grinch managed to lift the sleigh full of presents all by himself. The impact of that scene was so big that it made its way into the live-action movie. But why wasn't it in the Illumination movie? Maybe because they were trying to remain as faithful to the original story as possible. Or they were trying to distance themselves from the other two adaptations as much as possible. This special holds a place in all of our hearts as one of the best Christmas specials of all time. But it's also one of the best Dr. Seuss adaptations of all time. According to The Cat in the Hat and the movie In Search of Dr. Seuss, it's been said that the Grinch is Dr. Seuss's favorite character, but then backpedaled on that statement by saying he was his second favorite. Probably out of vanity or something. I hope you all enjoyed this 12-in-1 review, and if you all like this video, please let me know if you do. From One Fish, Two Fish, and Green Eggs and Ham. From Grinch, Cat in the Hat, Lorax, Horton, Sam I Am. Dr. Seuss gave us a childhood that we'll never forget, with rhymes and characters knowing that we won't regret having his legacy involved in our youth from the moment we were born before our very first tooth. To end this video on a good note, here's a fabulous Dr. Seuss quote. From there to here, from here to there, funny things are everywhere.